How many of you have ever house sat for someone? You know, like they're going on vacation, you go over to their house and watch their house. If you're, if you're, yeah, you can raise your hand. And if you're online, let us know in that chat room if you've ever had to house sit for someone. Um, I'm going to be honest with you and uh, super judgmental for a moment. I don't get it. Like house sitting, what's the purpose and why? Why would you? want a house, someone to watch your stuff. I mean, like, what are you expecting to happen in the next seven days? Is someone going to break in? Is your house haunted? And why do you think somebody being at your house is going to deter something from happening? On the flip side of that, if somebody ever asked you to watch their house, these are all the questions you should be thinking too before you go and watch their haunted house. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's weird. Now, one of the things I understand a little bit more is when someone asks you to watch uh, a pet, you know, because it's a responsible thing as a pet owner to feed and water uh, your animals. Like, that's the bare minimum of your responsibilities. And so if you're not going to be able to because you're going on vacation, then the right thing to do is to get someone to come over and feed and water and take out your dog, okay? But one of the things I don't understand, and I've heard this a lot in Madison, and some of you might be in the room or watching online, you want people to watch your animals and you let them stay at your house so that the animals don't get lonely. I'm judging you again. Okay, please. I, I want to make sure there's no confusion about this. I think your cat would like a week off from you and people in general. I don't know a lot about cats. I'm not a cat person per se, but I mean, your cat's social life isn't going to tank for seven days while you're gone. I mean, it's just, it's weird. Okay. So you, yeah, you, maybe I'm shallow, obviously not a cat person, personal illustration now. Okay. So you guys can now judge me and make fun of me. Um, when Oliver, my oldest son, who's three was newly born, there was like one, maybe two people that we trusted to watch him. And it didn't matter if we were gone for like 15 minutes or 45 minutes because we never really left them for longer than that because we were like obsessed and, and didn't trust anybody. And so um, when we had people watch Oliver, we would spell out like minute by minute what he's supposed to do. Like at 504, you got to feed him an applesauce packet. At 504, don't mess around. And then it was like at six o'clock, you got to get him in this bedtime routine. And, and here's what happens. You got to read him two books and then you got to tuck him in this way. And then you got to play that musical giraffe that he likes so much. And then turn the light off, shut the door. You can check in after 15 minutes. But, and I would do this. And then we always, you know, that's all the normal stuff that you do. And then we would cover stuff that wasn't normal. Like, hey, if an asteroid happens to hit their planet Earth while we are out. Here's what we would like you to do, okay? Um, and so we were crazy. And now see how this is reciprocated. Uh, you guys can now judge me, okay? So um, ever since Elijah was born, our second boy, we've become really, um, I don't want to say neglectful parents because that's not true, but it went from like having one babysitter to who can come over and watch our kid. It went from here's the minute by minute play to keep them alive. And if something does go wrong, call 911 first, okay? Don't call me first. Call somebody who can actually help first. And so We've really kind of backed off on that, but I, I'm leading this way because I think that we can all understand, um, like watching a house, that's, that's low stress. The couch isn't going to walk out on its own in most situations, okay? Watching somebody's pets, a little bit more stress, a little bit more pressure, but again, you come over, fill the bowls, walk them. Um, play solitaire with the cat. I don't know. You do that. It's a little bit more pressure. But then when we're watching kids, like there's a lot of pressure either as a parent or as a babysitter because there's a lot that goes into it. You're trusting someone else with something that is very, very important to you. Now, I'm going to come back to this and what we're talking about um, in just a moment. But let's take a quick detour because we've been in this series uh, called In the Beginning. We actually just began it um, last week. And we're going to go to Genesis. If you want to follow along with me, you can use those blue Bibles or your smartphone. We'll have the words on the screen, um, but we're going to go to Genesis. And in the first few pages of Genesis, we learn that God had a dream for the world. He did not create because he was bored. He did not create because he was looking for something to do the next few thousands or millions of years. God created out of a desire. He just wanted to. Um, and in the beginning, God dreamt of a world that was full of beauty and community and oneness. But as long as it's not your first day on earth, and I'm looking at all of you, it is clearly not your first day on earth, you know that the world is not just full of beauty, community, and oneness. The world can be an absolutely beautiful place. It could also be a very ugly place, right? You turn on the news and you see some new natural disaster or some sort of terrorist act. It can be a very ugly place. Um, there is community, you're in community right now. We can be in community when we leave and we go out to lunch. And at the same time, there's a lot of isolation. 
As a matter of fact, they, they talk about people who live in cities are actually lonelier than people who live in like rural towns. Now, you would think that living in a city with all the other people and all the extra people that you wouldn't be lonely. But the fact is, is that you see people so much that you begin to tune them out. They're just part of the background. And so you don't begin to see people and they don't see you either. And so cities can be very lonely places. And there is oneness. There's no doubt about that. But I would argue that there's more division than there is unity in the United States of America in 2019. And so we can say that God had this really kind of neat dream planned out. We talked about that a lot last week, what God's dream looks like in that a lot has gone wrong as we can just look around and not just look around, but can you kind of feel it inside of you that something's just a little off? And so um, what this series has been about is learning how God didn't press a cosmic reset button. He didn't say, oh, Adam and Eve, the first humans, messed up, darn, and reset it like I reset my Super Nintendo. He didn't do that, okay? Instead, ever since that very first mistake and those first mistakes and those selfish choices that people have been making and entire communities have been making for thousands of years, God has been pursuing. Now, there was a period in time when people were looking forward to the Messiah, and we get to look back at the life of the Messiah who comes, lives the life we should have lived, died the death we all now deserve, rose again, overcoming death for every single one of us, that we might have our best lives ever. Now, I'm beginning to um, you know, repeat a lot, but one thing I want to mentioned before we move on to today's specific topic was that God made everything out of nothing. And every time he made something, he declares, it's good. He's like, animals, it's good. The mountains and the sea, it's good. And outer space, it's good. And the planet Earth, and it's good. And then he creates man, and he does not declare it is good. And it's not because men are screw-ups, although we do screw up a lot. Um, but it is because what God, who exists in community as the Trinity, that's the church word for the Father, Spirit, and Son, our God, three in one, exists in community. And what wasn't good about the man was that the man was alone. And God wanted man to experience and humans to experience that community that God himself has always experienced. So God creates a partner and a companion for humans. And uh, then he declares, it is good. And all the women say it was good because God made us. He didn't quite get the formula right the first time. But you know, God didn't make a mistake. He, he knew what he was doing. Um, and so, again, a lot of this content is available on YouTube, but talking about, we're going to advance the conversation. So last week we talked about kind of what was the big idea here on God's stream? What did it look like in the beginning? Where is it now? How can we play a part? And today I want to talk about really practically how we can play a part in redeeming God's dream. And it has to do with creation. And if you went to Genesis, um, we're going to just be in that first chapter still. We're going to go to verse 26. And here's what happens. It says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the animals that scurry along the ground. Now you can read the next two verses if you wanted to. I'm not going to put them up there for you. But essentially, God did what he said he was going to do right here. Okay, just there's a verse, this is what God intends to do, and the next two verses like, yeah, yeah, bada bing, bada boom. He actually did it. Now, God tells those very first human beings, you have a job. You've got one job. He doesn't say, congratulations, come on down. You've won yourself a brand new earth. You will come take it for a test drive. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you own creation. Hope you like this gift. God owns creation. God creates humans, and he says, and you are the caretaker. See, out of everything God makes, the sky, the water, the land, God declares it is good. But it's not until he creates humans that he says, I'm going to make something in my image. He creates humans, and he sets them apart. You are different from the rest of creation. But that doesn't mean, and sometimes we take it to an extreme where it's like, well, then we can do whatever we want to creation because we're humans. And actually, God says, no, it, precisely because you're humans, I want you to take care of creation. I want you to be the earth's stewards. And uh, again, so I think that some of these things are misconceptions in faith that we think, well, I'm a human, and so it doesn't really matter what I do to earth because God gave it to me. He didn't. God gave it to us to be caretakers, but it is still his. He owns it. Creation belongs to God. It always has, and it always will. We are caretakers. We're called to take care of um, God's creation. 
But I think the reality is, and maybe this is what you're feeling right now, you're like, I'm bored. And okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the apathy that a lot of us feel toward God's creation, myself included. I don't know how many of us wake up every morning and wonder about like how we're treating the planet. If we ever think about that, when I wake up in the morning, think about the coffee I'm about to drink, think about how tired I am, think about one of the kids that are screaming. I got two, so there's like two chances that that could happen. Um, But I want to talk today that creation matters and creation care matters. And I want you to hang with me while we do this, because I I really do believe that it's firmly rooted in one of the very first things that we find out about God in Genesis 1, is that we are supposed to take care of creation. It's called the cultural mandate in kind of the seminary world, um, but that's not important now. But I'm going to argue that when God created everything, he looks around and he says, it's good, it's good, it's good, I'm going to create man in my image, oh, look, I'm going to create a partner, it's good. And now I want to say, okay, so for the last thousands or millions of years, whatever kind of you fall in with the old earth, young earth conversation, okay, that I want to say, how have we done as the earth's stewards? How have we done in caretaking? So let's just evaluate that together. I got a few th- stats that it honestly I just googled it and it just all of these things popped up there's no shortage of articles you can fact check me if you want Um, Americans make up five percent of the world's population only five percent however we use up 25 percent of the world's natural resources we're five percent of the population and we use one-fourth of the world's natural resources. That gives, okay, so let's talk about the other side of the coin. That gives the 95% of the other world only three-fourths to divvy out with, okay? So, like, we get a lot of it, they get a little of it. Okay, how about this one? Each year, 1.2 trillion gallons of untreated sewage, stormwater, and industrial waste are dumped into our water. Think about that the next time you take a shower. Brush your teeth. Mm. Moving on. And while children only make up 10% of the world's population, over 40% of the global burden of disease falls on them. What the heck does that even mean? Um, More than 3 million children under the age of 5 will die this year from environmental factors, things that are completely preventable, things that we don't not have a cure for, things that are completely under our control, and 3 million children under the age of 5 will die because we don't do anything. So would God look at the world as is? And I think that there are... Please don't be super critical and think that I'm just picking on us. I addressed right at the beginning, I think that there is beauty in the world. But let's talk about the flip side of that and talk about some of the ugliness. Would God look at the world and say, 3 million kids dying this year under the age of 5, would God look at that and say, this is good? And I think as his stewards, we take responsibility for that. It's not the hippies, the tree huggers, the environmentalists, the liberals, the progressives, the whoever's, the whatever's, the whenever's. This is the a distinctly Christian perspective found before we ever get to Genesis chapter 2. Within the first chapter of Genesis, we're told you are the stewards, you are the caretakers. And so as we look around in our world today and we look around and we say, how have we done? And we look at these, there's a responsibility that falls on us. And I think that there's two reactions we can like, kind of bury our head in the sand and say, uh, I don't want anything to do with that. Let's just keep, I don't want to think about it. Let's just keep doing what we've been doing. Or we can take responsibility. And I hope that, you know, I can convince you in our time together this morning that let's all take a step toward taking responsibility, every single person in here. I mean, we can't control what the rest of the world is doing, but we can control what we do, and we can control the decisions that we make every single day. So, um, you know, don't check out, don't log off if you're watching online. Let me explain why I think it's very important. Some people would say, well, aren't there more important issues to care about? Why? Well, I, I mean, I would argue that caring for creation is deeply spiritual. It's one of the very first things God tells human beings to do before the Ten Commandments are ever coming out, before Jesus gives... Um, Um, all of his parables and beatitudes and all of that. Before we get any of that, God says you have to take care of creation. Now, I'm going to swing over to Leviticus, and you don't have to follow me because we're just going to spend just a brief time. And I know going to Leviticus, you're like, oh, man, you made what already is such an interesting topic even more riveting. Okay, just calm down. I get it. Leviticus isn't very exciting. As a matter of fact, true story from seminary, when I was getting a master's degree in theology, we had paper 
um, course registration forms. And so when I had to register, and this wasn't like 20 years ago, this was five years ago. And so when we were registering, I had to take some Old Testament classes, I'm registering for Old Testament, and I wanted to take a book study on Proverbs. Proverbs, because it's the Old Testament book, most like the New Testament, and then my New Testament was my focus. And so I accidentally wrote in like B-I-T-H, which is like the course code, and then like 507 or whatever it was, and I turned it in. And then they emailed me my schedule, and it was like, you're taking a book study on Leviticus and Numbers. And I said, ah, oh, that's such a mistake. Well, you know, the benefit of them having a paper copy with my handwriting is that they also had a receipt that showed that I did, in fact, write the wrong course number on there. I wanted like 508, and I wrote 507. And I said, well, can I switch it? And they said, yes, yeah, no problem. It's just a $500 exchange fee. So I guess I'm taking Leviticus this semester. And, uh, and you know what? It was, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was brutal. It was brutal. But I'll tell you, I got to the end of that course in studying Leviticus, and I think I understood what Jesus did a whole lot better after studying Leviticus. Now, it is rough. It's a hard read. I'll give it to you. I'm just going to full transparency. That's why at our church, when we tell you to start reading the Bible, we tell you to start in Matthew, not Genesis. Because three books later in, in the New Testament, you get to Mark and John and Luke and Acts. And you're like, okay, this is great. I can keep reading this. Three books into the Old Testament, you start getting into Leviticus numbers. We lose like 99% of you guys because you're like all the blood and all the rules and what are we doing with? So I get it. I'm not saying it's not confusing, but let's look at this ancient law at just two examples, and you could go home and read the rest of Leviticus if you wanted to. You're going to find way more, but let's look at two spots in which God addresses creation care, okay? The first one in Leviticus is chapter 25, and it's verses 3 through 5, and this is the law. And God says, uh, for six years you may plant your fields and prune your vineyards and harvest your crops, but during the seventh year the land must have a Sabbath year of complete rest. It is the Lord's Sabbath. Do not plant your fields or prune your vineyards during that year. And don't store away the crops that grow on their own or gather the grapes from your unpruned vines. The land must have a year of complete rest. So God is saying, you know, this is an agricultural society. He's saying, hey, every six years, you've got to give the land a break. Now, we always talk about a break for ourselves, right? We, I, and that's something we've taught from this stage at Madison Church. Have a Sabbath. Take a Saturday off where you're not doing anything. Just a time for you to, to recover and relax and connect with God again. We always talk about that. And God is saying, hey, creation also needs a Sabbath. Now, I am not a scientist, and nor am I a farmer, okay? so But I looked this up for all of us. I found it on Wikipedia, so you can believe it, okay? But the perk here is in an agricultural society that didn't have the scientific advancements that we have today, God is actually helping them out. Because you see, if you were to just like, let's say, plant corn every single year in the same plot of land, what ends up happening is that corn is going to suck out all of the nutri nutrients out of that soil. And pretty soon you're going to get some crappy corn and then you're going to get some no corn. Am I right, Jeff? Yes. And so you rotate your crops and your fields. Now, again, this was thousands of years ago, and God is saying, hey, I'm going to help you out. We got to give the earth a break. Every, you know, six years or seven years, you're going to give it a break. Um, he's conscious of the world, so much so that he puts it in the law. As caretaker of creation, he also gives the Israelites this command in chapter 23, verse 22. says, when you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields. And do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. Now, in our society, in the United States of America, we are constantly told and sold. I mean, every time a commercial comes on, I mean, you can't even listen to podcasts anymore without them starting with a commercial, them in the middle taking a commercial break, and at the end. I mean, there's always somebody trying to tell you what you don't have, and you need more, 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 more of it. And it just keeps going on and on like that. And this is where God says, hey, you know what? Be generous. Practice generosity. There are people among you who are poor. Uh, this word for foreigners living among you can be translated into refugees. And he says, care for them. And we're going to care for them through the world and our care of the world. Again, this isn't just for the hippies or the tree huggers. This is something for every single person who called themselves a follower of God up until that point. Well, why would God put this into the law? And I think that he's just saying that this is important. 
it, it never stopped being important. And I think that maybe if you're this community and the Israelites and you're walking around in the wilderness and you're about to get to the promised land and God gives you this laws and all these do's and all these don'ts and it's gonna and in some cases help you live a better life, I think that you're like, well, does creation care really matter? And God's saying, yeah, it still matters. God didn't change his mind. God didn't flip his position on that. He says it still matters so much, so I'm gonna put it in the law. And again, it reminds us that creation is God's. It is not ours. And I feel like I got to keep coming back to that because I think that we think like we buy the house, like that's my house, that's my property, this is mine, I can do whatever I want. And God is saying, no, you are a steward of it. Now, I should also note here um, that creation is not God. Creation is not God. And sometimes it's really easy for us um, to make creation kind of an idol. That we look at the world around us and, and we go into the mountains or we go to the beaches and we love them and then sometimes we idolize those things and we kind of turn them into God. But creation is not God. Okay, we should worship God, not his creation. Creation is awesome, but it is not God. Creation is ours to take care of, but again, we are the part of creation that is set apart following? Okay. So what should we do about this? I think there are a few things we can do. One, I think we need to just make a choice to be intentional about caring for creation. It's not an accident that God provided the Israelites an extensive amount of details in the law on how to take care of creation. Uh, the amount of intentionality showed that God um, is also very intentional. So I would say the first thing for you to do is to make a choice that, hey, I would, I'm going to take one step, a step, toward being a better steward of, of this creation of our planet than I was um, before I came here. And I don't expect you to remember this message, honestly, but I would think it was pretty cool that if in a year or two you made other decisions because of what had occurred during this time that we have together. And so um, apathy and inaction are not an option for you. If you are a follower of Jesus, you can't not care about the earth. You can't uh, I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. We can't be abusive and neglectful toward it. And so make a plan about how you can be more intentional. Perhaps you buy a water purifier in your home instead of a bottle of water or bottles of water. Buy a purifier and use a reusable glass. Right now, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, there is a continent of plastic twice the size of North America uh, just floating there. And so one of the things that you can do to take better care of creation maybe is to buy like a water purifier. One example, come up with your own too. You could uh, recycle instead of throwing everything away. This is Madison. They make it really easy to recycle. Um, walk, bike, and take public transit when possible. Yes, this means planning ahead. That might be the most challenging thing I said all day. Plan ahead and see when you can walk somewhere, bike somewhere, take public transit. Madison is an awesome town to do things outside. Take advantage of living in this city, okay? So we're going to be intentional. The second thing is that I think that when you are intentional about taking care of creation, I think that you will draw near and closer to God through creation. Again, God is not creation, but we can grow closer to God through creation. I think that there's a lot of power. Uh, just a couple months ago, my family and I, we took a vacation to Summit County, Colorado. And so like the altitude we were at was like constantly 10,000, 11,000 feet. We left Denver and it was uh, like 95 degrees and we got up to the mountains and we were coming down to some places where the sun barely shines and there's still like snow on the ground and it dropped down to 40 degrees, a 50 degree swing by just you know, going up into altitude and into the mountains. And it was like, this is so awesome. And it wasn't just awesome because it's beautiful and it's scenic, but to take a moment and say, wow, like God created this. Like this was, this was God's vision for this. However, this came to be, God had a vision for this. This doesn't have to be mountains. It could be white beaches and blue water. I know some of you get really excited about the Bahamas around February. I would and do um, as well. But when do we take time to pause and reflect and, and not just take in nature, but to say, hey, I can actually grow closer to God in this solitude. Um, again, I think that we can do that. I think that we can care for the poor by caring for creation. 
Now you and I live in a world, every single person in here, okay, so I'm going to be blunt, a little confrontational, I tend to do that every other week, get in a bad mood <laughs> when I'm writing my message apparently. Uh, <laughs> you and I live in a world, every single person in the room can afford bottled water. If you can't, I have bottled water out there you can take with you, okay. We all live in a world in which we can buy plastic bottles. We all live in a world where our food, the large majority of it, comes from a grocery store, okay? So you and I honestly are never really confronted with having to take care of the environment because we never see how us not taking care of it affects things. It's actually the people who are poorest in the world who are most affected by the way that we live um, today. Remember when I talked about three million children dying every year because of environmental causes, a lot of those kids are from India. When I looked it up, a large portion of those kids are from India. A large portion of them are from Africa. And it's, so it's those other countries and those other places that don't have grocery stores, that can't buy the bottled water, that are drinking out of dirty water and are being most affected by our choices. And so when we talk, and we talk about it a lot, I, I believe that this church, what's ingrained in our culture is we believe in reaching out and we believe in giving back. And I think that a lot of you are passionate about that and you volunteer and you give your finances and you want to make a difference. But one of the ways that you have to consider making a difference is how is how you are living affecting other people around the world. And so by just making a choice of using a reusable bag, which all of the convenience stores and Walmarts and Targets now put them up at the front. I mean, yes, I know. It's a win-win for them because they're going to sell you a bag that costs two cents to make for a buck, and then they're also not going to have to order plastic bags. I get that from a corporate America standpoint, they make money. But from your standpoint, what you're able to control, you're leaving the world in a better place, not just for your kids, but for your grandkids. And let's just be honest. I know that sometimes we're like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and I didn't have this growing up. But come on, can we quit saying that? Like, that's so lame. I didn't have that growing up. Are you saying that you really don't want a better world for your kids? Like, do you not like them that much? I love my kids. I hope that they do have it a little bit easier than I had it. You know, I don't want them to be spoiled and brats, but dang it, like, why wouldn't I want to leave something better for them? I, I don't know. I, I think that we should go out for coffee and talk if you don't want what's better for your kids, okay? Like today, we should talk about that. Um, so I think that we can care for the poor by taking care of um, creation. Remember that each year 1.2 trillion gallons of untreated sewage water is dumped into your um, water. It's gross, but most of us don't have to worry about it because of purifiers and bottled water, but the rest of the world doesn't have that choice. Remember, we're using 25% of the resources and giving the rest of the world to fight over three-fourths of it. Um, our consumption, our use of natural resources, output of waste, um, these things not only affect God's creation, um, but they affect it negatively. And all the things that God looked around and said, hey, this is good, that's good, this is good. Now in 2019, I think that we have to confront that as stewards, it's not always good. And it's not God's fault. It's who we put in charge of its fault, which is mine. And it's yours. It's ours. We can say it's ours. That way we don't feel too bad about it. Um, creation belongs to God. We've been entrusted with it. And when we care for the earth, we reflect the character of our creator. Remember, right at the beginning, everything was good and everything was as it should be. Creation care was perfect back then. In Genesis 131, God looked over all he had made and saw it was very good. That's God's dream. He wants to look over all the world, not just the United States, but the entire world. God made the entire world. He made all of these different people. He wants to look over all of it and say it's very good. Are we doing our part? At the beginning, there was no illness. There was no um, terrorism. There were none of these big natural disasters. It was perfect. And so we can't move forward in this series, talking about God's dream last week, without first talking about this. And what kind of choices do we make on a daily basis? Though the world we live in is presently far from God and it's far from the place that um, God wants it to be, you and I, all of us, can start making decisions today, right now, and going forward to make this world a little bit more like how it was in the garden and how it's going to be in the future. Now, are we going to do that? Are we going to maybe inconvenience ourselves a little bit 
by leaving a little early so that we can walk or bike somewhere. Are we going to inconvenience ourselves by buying a water purifier and having to carry a water bottle around with us? Are we going to inconvenience ourselves by doing these things? Or are we just going to let the burden of responsibility fall on someone else? And I just think that it's a really terrible testimony to us as Christians. And I wouldn't suppose that every single person in the room is a Christian. You may not be a believer. If you're watching online, you may not be a believer, and that's okay. And 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 really, this conversation has nothing to do with political leanings. I mean, if you're hearing that right now, like, whoop, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm saying this is a distinctly Christian perspective, and that we should care for the earth that God created, and care for the earth that God put us in charge for. But will we do it? You guys pray with me. Father, um, you know, it's not exactly the most exciting topic to talk about, but God, it is such an important topic to talk about as we know that the decisions that we're making every day are, are costing lives all over the world and, and lives of people who are like the most innocent. Just my heart is so burdened this week when, when I'm reading that three million kids are dying of things that are completely preventable because of decisions that we make every single day and, and decisions that maybe we didn't know we were making uh, decisions we didn't know, the ripple effect of those consequences of the decisions we're making. But God, uh, I would just pray that you would put that burden on all of us that, you know what, maybe three million kids are going to die this year. And maybe us switching um, from plastic water bottles that we throw away to reusable water bottles, maybe that's not going to change that number. But that God, as we each begin to do this as followers of Jesus and encourage and challenge each other to live that way, that maybe not this year, but maybe in 10 years, that number is decreased because of the decisions that we're making. God, give us the boldness and confidence to step out and to do these things, to help restore your dream, the dream of, of how humanity and creation was supposed to interact, that this was a good world, that it was very good, that you declared it was very good. And as we look around now, we, we'd say, well, it's not, it's not that good. God, give us the courage to step out into that. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.